Thank you. Um, am I audible back there? While the man way in the back is giving me a thumbs up. It's so lovely to be back at one of the best bookstores in the whole world. I was thinking on the way over here that I probably haven't written a single book, and I, th I think this one's number 16, that hasn't involved research at Moe's, browsing at Moe's, uh, things that have fed my imagination at Moe's, all four floors. So it's really wonderful to be back at Moe's and to see my friend Summer looking, living up to her name uh, in the middle, and my fabulous students Amruta and Gabriella from UC Berkeley in the back. So this, is a, this book has had a funny history. I wrote an essay very casually. The great writer Marina Citrin was staying with me. She'd kind of taken refuge with me from a marital breakup. And the first evening she got really cheerful and a bottle of wine was involved. I started <coughs> regaling her and my brother David with half-jokingly with this n proposal that I was going to write something someday called Men Explain Things to Me and just started telling stories. And Marina looked at me very intently through the red wine and said, you need to write that down because young people, young women like my sister need to know that the problem isn't them. This happens to women all the time and they need to know it. And Mar I, at that time, had a house where like you're either in my bedroom or you're in the other big room. It was very big, but it was a two-room uh, attic. And so Marina slept in later than me those days, so I served her men explain things to me for breakfast and then tried to figure out what to do with it. And, uh, and of course, like most of the essays that I feel most strongly about, the political essays over the past dozen years, it went to Tom Englehart at Tom Dispatch. And then it went out, and I'd gotten a bit used to in the five years at that point, it is so warm here, at um, heat wave book TV people who are filming, heat wave in the Bay Area, cli <laughs> climate change alert, and um, so, and I'd, I'd gotten used to the fact that Tom Dispatch really reaches people, but of everything I've ever put out online, nothing's ever had the life that Men Explain Things do, uh, has. It reached so many people. It kept circulating. I don't think a week's gone by in the last few years that I haven't heard about it from somebody, seen it recirculated, quoted, referenced, etc. I am falsely credited with uh, coining the term mansplaining. Um, how many of you have heard the word mansplaining? Has it, how many of you haven't heard the word mansplaining? Really? Wow. It's like 50-50. I thought the word was like, you know, that it was a virus everybody had, uh, had caught by now. <laughs> but I was, Times, I was the New York Times 2010 Word of the Year. I didn't, I'm, apparently this essay inspired it. I did not actually coin it. I was a bit ambivalent about the word because it seems a little more condemnatory of the male of the species than I ever wanted to be uh, categorically. But a wonderful young academic at Berkeley explained to me a couple weeks ago that no, this is a great word, this is an important word. Until we had this word, we all had this experience that we had no way to explain. You'd have to, you know, you didn't have a reference point, you didn't know if it was just you, you didn't know kind of what to do about it. Mansplaining this gives you this kind of handy portmanteau uh, way to go at it. So, you know, that's happened. There's an academic blog called Men Expl Academic Men Explain Things to Me, on uh, which academic women post their latest tribulations. Um, you know, so we decided, what the hell? It should be a commencement gift. Um, <laughs> so for people of all genders, and decided to put it out in this little edition with six other essays, two of them never published before, um, from various places, all dealing with feminists and gender politics. <laughs> So, and it's funny, somebody said to me, you don't really write about feminism normally, do you? And I was like, in a way, everything I've ever written is feminist. And Savage Dreams, which came out in 1994, is now in this gorgeous new Richard Mizrak photograph on the cover, uh, 20th anniversary edition, Priced Trade, thank you, UC Press. Um, you know, is full of really powerful women. And uh, uh, The Far Away Nearby, which is about my relationship with my mother in part is not particularly explicitly feminist, but it is so implicitly feminist about the things that can destroy a woman's sense of herself and what the consequences can be and what happens if you believe the stories they tell you about uh, femininity and what women need to be and beauty, all the beauty problems. You all know about the beauty problems, right? So, but I could go on forever, but it would be much better if I just read to you. 
Min explained things to me. I still don't know why Sally and I bothered to go to that party in the forest slope above Aspen. The people were all older than us and dull in a distinguished way, old enough that we at 40-ish passed as the occasion's young ladies. The house was great, if you like Ralph Lauren-style chalets, a rugged luxury cabin at 9,000 feet, complete with elk antlers, lots of kilims, and a wood-burning stove. We were preparing to leave when our host said, no, stay a little longer so I can talk to you. He was an imposing man who'd made a lot of money. He kept us waiting while the other guests drifted out into the summer night and then sat us down at his authentically grainy wooden table and said to me, so, I hear you've written a couple of books. I said, several, actually. He said, in that way you encourage your friend's seven-year-old to describe flute practice. And what are they about? They're actually about quite a few different things, the six or seven out by then. But I began to speak only of the most recent on that summer day in 2003, River of Shadows, Edward Moybridge and the Technological Wild West my book on the annihilation of time and space and the industrialization of everyday life. He cut me off soon after I mentioned Moybridge. And have you heard about the very important Moybridge book that came out this year? So caught up was I. How many of you know how this ends? <laughs> well, I hope this is like a, a reassuring bedtime story that you'll enjoy <laughs> every time. Here it is again. So caught up was I in my assigned role as ingenue that I was perfectly willing to entertain the possibility that another book on the same subject had come out simultaneously and I'd somehow missed it. He was already telling me about the very important book with that smug look I know so well in a man holding forth, eyes fixed on the fuzzy far horizon of his own authority. Here let me just say that my life is well sprinkled with lovely men with a long succession of editors who have, since I was young, listened to and encouraged me and published me with my infinitely generous younger brother, with splendid friends of whom it could be said, like the clerk in the Canterbury Tales I still remember from Mr. Pellin's class on Chaucer, gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Still there are these other men, too. So Mr. Very Important was going on smugly about this book I should have known when Sally interrupted him to say, that's her book. <laughs> or tried to interrupt him anyway, but he just continued on his way. She had to say, that's her book, three or four times before he finally took it in. And then, as if in a 19th century novel, he went ashen, that I was indeed the author of the very important book. It turned out he hadn't read, just read about it in the New York Times book review a few months ago. <laughs> so confused, the neat categories into which his world was sorted, that he was stunned speechless for a moment before he began holding forth again. Being women, we were politely out of earshot before we started laughing, and we've never really stopped. <laughs> so, see, now it's, it's, now what is it? It's six, uh, 11 years later. See, still, it, it was very, I like incidents of that sort, when forces that are usually so sneaky and hard to point out slither out of the grass and as obvious as, say, an anaconda that's eaten a cow or an elephant turd on the carpet. Yes, people of both genders pop up at events. Notably at most, book readings in Berkeley have always been special. People of both genders pop up at events to hold forth on irrelevant things and conspiracy theories, but the out-and-out -out confrontational confidence of the totally ignorant is, in my experience, gendered. Men explain things to me, another woman, whether they know what they're talking about. Some men. Every woman knows what I'm talking about. It's a presumption that makes it hard at times for any woman in any field, that keeps women from speaking up and from being heard when they dare, that crushes young women into silence by indicating, the way harassment on the street does, that this is not their world. It trains us in self-doubt and self-limitation, just as it exercises men's unsupported overconfidence. I wouldn't be surprised if part of the trajectory of American politics since 2001 was shaped by, for example, the inability to hear Colleen Rowley, the FBI woman who issued those early warnings about Al-Qaeda, and it was certainly shaped by a Bush administration to which you couldn't tell anything, including that Iraq had no links to Al-Qaeda and no WMDs, or that the war was not going to be a cakewalk. Even male experts couldn't penetrate the fortress of their smugness. Arrogance might have had something to